All right. Let's see if I can get this lined out. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Um, seems this subject is something that God brings me back to over and over again to just um, refresh us, to teach us to endure. Um, I can only speak about the subject through my own experiences. Uh, it would sound really quite different if um, you know Raymond was teaching or Chuck was teaching it because our experiences are different. And so I can only speak from my own experiences about this, that there are things that, um, that happen. This is enemy territory. And God permits storms and fiery trials and sufferings. And they come from a lot of different places. Yeah, it's possible that God plans some of our sufferings, some of them, um, to um, develop us. But the Bible speaks about how He uses what the enemy does and causes that to our good. But then sometimes we just do things to ourselves, you know. Um, people that drink too much, well, they have liver disease. People that smoke too much, generally they'll have lung cancer. Sometimes people just do things to themselves or they drive reckless so they have a wreck. And it's, it's not something necessarily that God planned out or Satan did to you, but you did it to yourself. So there are things that come from all kinds of directions. And um, one thing that I know, I know the conclusion of this, Either your sufferings are going to destroy you and you'll give up or they'll, God will use them to develop you. It's your choice. It's your choice whether you run to God when you're in trouble or you run away from God when you're in trouble. And I, I know that a lot of people respond to sufferings by being angry at God. And they're angry that they even let, he even let this happen or allowed it to happen or all kinds of things. And I've seen people just go in to rebellion instead of being developed. But that, that whole thought process is really self-centered instead of trying, even trying to get God's perspective. And what I know is that I got to have God's perspective to even survive this down here. I got to see what he says about it. I got to try to understand the way he sees things. And I've got to try to surrender to his will or it's over for, for me. So that's what I do. Refinement, cleansing, and correction. This is obviously the first reason for some trials and suffering or storms, as we've uh, titled it. So we're going to look at a few verses about that. You know, in Malachi 3, verse 2 through 4, at the close of the Old Testament, he talked about him coming in a new way. And this is what he said in chapter 3, verse 2. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller soap. Now, this word fuller is just launderer. Some of the modern versions translate it that way. This is the Christian Standard Bible. So it's just a launderer soap. And he's just coming for refinement and for cleaning. For cleaning us up. And so, I want to stop there for a minute because we know how the refinement, we know the process of refinement. Most of us know something about it. Uh, from from simple things in life, I mean, maybe you've never tried to had a silver mine and melted down silver or gold, but some of you may have reloaded. Raymond has before, and and you know you purify lead too. You heat it up, the impurities come to the top. You scrape that away, you know, and uh, and you get a better product to make bullets out of. Well, in the case of silver, that's going to be a little different because this is what refiners generally do. Because gold and silver is, you know, what, what worth is based upon or money is based upon, generally. 
at least until the end times when they digitalize it and all of it. But, but before it was always gold backed or silver backed or what have you and coins were silver or gold and that was the monetary system. Well, if you, if you heat silver up, well, dross comes to the top. And the way that you know that this silver is ready as you scrape this away is when the, um, when the uh, refiner sees his reflection in the silver. And that's what God wants to do with us. He wants to take away our sins. Whenever he heats up, our, we're heated up through trial, through sufferings and storms. And whatever you got in you that is bad, it's going gonna, it's gonna to surface. Because that's, the, generally the devil knows what your faults are. He knows what your weaknesses are. And when you get hurt or wounded really bad, that's exactly where you're going to get attacked. And whatever's coming up, that's what God wants to take away. Whatever boils out, that's what he wants to take away. He wants us to ask for help with that. To be able to have power over that, to take away the sins of that, and uh, he, God wants to see His reflection. He wants to see the life of Christ being manifested in our bodies. So, that's what a refiner does, and uh, we know what a launderer does with his soap. He cleans up, washes away filth. So, this is what Jesus is saying that He's going to do. In this, new, in this new covenant, when he comes, he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, and they may, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So this is his plan at the close of the Old Testament. We know the gospel went out to the Jews first. He said he was coming to refine them. He's going to sit as a refiner and purify them. And so the, the reason why, he wanted this relationship to be, to be right. He wanted their offerings to be an offering in righteousness. So that relationship could be right between him and men. God desires that. He wants that, to have a right relationship with us. And so he was, gonna, he was saying he was going to sit as this refiner and purifier. And then he says, Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and former years. And so... As time goes on, it's the same with churches. Sin and corruption, politics, all the things that are bad creep in. And he, he wants to uh, refine that. He wants that offering to be, to be pleasant to him, as in former times. Like for us, you know, that would have been, you know, in the days of restoration and reformation, whenever they were cleansing the church of, um, of everything that wasn't God's. And uh, asking people to return to the Scriptures. So when we look in the New Testament in 1 Peter 4, verse 12 through 14, it says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. He's saying that these fiery trials, you got to expect them as long as you're down here. This is where the, re this is where the refinement takes place, is here. There's no refinement in heaven it's done here. Okay? And so, so he says, don't think this is something unusual because this is life. But rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. And we know that when Jesus was here, he went through the worst kind of sufferings. And he's saying that we are now becoming partakers of sufferings because we're associated with them. Sometimes it's, it's, sometimes it's just because of that fact. You know, in countries like Iran, where the fastest growing church in the world is, you can be killed for being a Christian. And in China, you go to prison for three years, get caught worshiping Jesus. Three years. You know, and I saw a video this week where a guy was in China, and he asked, um, he asked 22 people, how many of you have been to prison for being a Christian? And 18 of them raised their hand. So they suffered for being a Christian. It says, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. And their part, on their part he, he is evil spoken of, but on your part Jesus is glorified. So when we suffer for the name of Christ or reproached for being a Christian, 
then he's saying that, that that means a lot to Jesus because he suffered when he was down here and now we're partakers of his suffering. So fiery trials are something that are going to happen if we're Christians in this place because this is ruled by Satan. We're in enemy territory. This is not your heaven and it's never going to be your heaven, not at least until Jesus takes it from him and the new earth. Then there, there, they'd be kind of like heaven and earth together there for a while. Something that's never been done. Correction is another reason, followed by comfort. So the Psalms, David's speaking out of his own experience. You know, he was just a little boy when some, the, the prophet of Israel that was established to be a prophet came and poured oil on his head. And the Spirit of God came upon him and he said he would be king. And it looked real good at first. The king that was rejected called him into his own household, had him playing a harp for him. He ended up killing Goliath and marrying his daughter. Then everything went really bad. Saul chased him into the hills and gave his, the, David's wife to another man. He spent his days running from the sword of Saul, hiding in caves, until one day he just left the land of Israel. And he was gone for a good while. I think it was about 14 months. And um, you know what? Things weren't good there. He began to work for the king of the Philistines and he began to raid villages. And the Bible says he didn't leave anybody alive. So they couldn't tell on him. Because he was lying and saying he was raiding the villages of Israel and bringing back spoils. So he had to be at his father's point away from God. What he was doing. But one day Saul went to battle and fell. And then they come looking for him in the land of uh, the Philistines to make him king. And all those promises that were made to him were fulfilled. But there was a, a come to Jesus moment then too. Because what he been doing to everybody else, someone did to him. When he was in Ziglag and he was out in the field, then some band came through and took away their families and destroyed their city, took away their spoils. And then he went and called for the ephod. It's time to talk to Jesus. Time to talk to God now. Well, God answered him and said, go after him and you'll recover everything. Well, that was the beginning of the restoration of their relationship. So David speaks out of his experience. And it's in Psalms 119, he says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. He's just saying, this is what happened. I was going astray. And, and then suddenly he brought this affliction upon me. But now he's back in God's service, keeping his word. Thou art good and doest good and teach, thy stat teach me thy statutes. So he's recognizing that God is good. He's not blaming God and rebelling God, rebelling and blaming Him for everything wrong in his life. He's not doing that. See, this way, the, there's the right response and the wrong response. So he responded to God and now he's back in a relationship with Him. He went through some things, but he's recognizing that God is good. See? And it says, he says, it was good, this is from a modern version, it was good that, that I had to suffer in order to learn your laws. You know, I think the King James Version says that in your righteousness you afflicted me. But it says in 72, um, the teachings that come from your mouth are worth more to me than ten thousands of, in gold or silver. So he's just recognizing the only thing of any value is the word of the Lord. In verse 73, it says, uh, Thy hands have made me, to, made me and fashioned me. He says, Give me understanding. So now he, you know, he wants to know God's ways and to under, get his perspective. And he says, So he says, Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and thou in thy faithfulness has afflicted me. That's probably the verse I was thinking about right there. So... He says, in your faithfulness you have afflicted me. So, his sufferings, he, he recognized in his case, was from the Lord. And it was only out of his own faithfulness that he went through those afflictions. And it was for this purpose. He was astray. Okay? 
Let I, he says, let I pray thee, thy merciful, merciful kindness be for my comfort. And so he went through some things, but it ended in merciful kindness and comfort. And, and one way or another, it'll be that way for all of us. Some of that merciful kindness and comfort may, may come from when we're in his presence. Some of it may very well come here while we're like it did for him. Let thy tender mercies come unto me that I may, that I may live, for thy law is my delight. So, you know, he's asking for these mercies now. You know, he, he wants this restored relationship. Uh, so, he is faithful even, even when we are not. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 11 through 13, it says, It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. He says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. If we believe not, yet He abideth faithful, He cannot deny Himself. And so, you know, I, I look at this and I see that there's, suffering is going to be required. And if we suffer with Him, we reign with Him. If we start to deny Him, to escape suffering, then He'll deny us. But He's abiding faithful whether we do or not. He can't deny Himself. Okay? So, um, he said it's a faithful saying. If we're dead with him, we'll also live with him. So, and he's talking about the crucifixion of the, fe the flesh because we're strange creatures, y'all. I mean, he took something heavenly and eternal and put it within a fleshly body with all of these powers, these fleshly powers and lusts that we have to overcome, which can only be done through the uh, work of the Spirit. So, conformity, that's another reason. The Bible clearly teaches us in Romans 8, verse 26 through 29, that He had a plan all alone for us to conform into the likeness of Christ. Well, you don't get silver and gold without heating it up and taking away the dross, and you don't get a, a, a pitcher without wetting the clay and forming it. And so, sufferings become the thing that makes us pliable for him to be a, for us to be a work of his hands. So in uh, Romans eight twenty six it says, "Likewise the Spirit helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, for the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groanings that cannot be uttered." Now, I just want to take that for a minute and talk to you about it. You might think the Holy Spirit praying for you is just bringing you all kinds of good stuff, but you don't even know what to ask for. The Holy Spirit is playing in your conformity, which also may include your sufferings. When He's asking for you, He's asking how to get you from what you are to in a Christ-likeness picture. And that's not going to be done without suffering and circumstances. So when He's praying for you, He's not asking for you to get a new car. He's praying for how to get you from what you are to Christ-likeness. And so this is whenever we, get, we look at this subject right here and we see the Holy Spirit's making intercessions. Let's see what the context teaches us about that. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. He knows how to ask according to God's will to pray for you. And then, then he goes immediately into these things about our circumstances. Because he's involved in our circumstances. And the enemy is too. And sometimes it's allowed. But we have a level of protection. But what is allowed has a purpose. And so it says, and we know that all things, and all things is our circumstances. They work together. And what he means by that, God is, the Lord is causing them for good. All things, whatever our circumstances, work together for good. God is causing them to work for good. To them that love God, to them who, who are called according to His purpose. And this is the whole crux of the matter. For whom He did foreknow, He did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. These sufferings are used to mold us to take away our dross and to conform us to the image of the Son of the living God. And so the Holy Spirit is involved in the plan of turning your circumstances into conforming you to 
Christ's likeness. And conforming to Christ's likeness does not happen without suffering. It just don't. Okay, this is, this is the plan for us down here. It is to be brought to a place where Christ can live out the Christian life within us and we're not rebelling against that move every step of the way because of our own personal desires. Our own want to's. So the resistance has got to be broken down so that Christ can live within us. And that's what these circumstances do. This is the plan. Before you were ever created, before the first man was ever created, that's what predestined was. We were predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. God never had no different ideal but to make you more like His Son. He never had a different ideal. He didn't come down here and bleed and suffer and die and hang all day upon the cross for you to do your own thing. He came down here to, to take away your sin and to give you the Holy Spirit which would prepare your body as a temple for Him to dwell and to live out the Christian life. And if you got someone telling you less than that, you need to move on. Because you're getting half a Bible. And half a Bible is just half a truth, which is no truth at all. Okay? In the potter's hand. So in Jeremiah 18, verse 1 through 6, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there will I cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, and he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessels that he made of clay was marred in his hand. So it's important to see that, that in this scripture, that as this potter, the, the Lord brought Jeremiah the prophet down to watch this potter, but he brought him to see something that he was making that didn't turn out. Well, sometimes that's you. That he's using suffering and molding to try to get you to be more Christ-like. And you're resisting and rebelling and you just get marred in his hand. And so what happened, the potter began to form it again. So he made again another vessel. So, so as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me and saying this, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. And so in Lamentations 4 verse 2, he says, The precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold, how are they esteemed earthen pitchers? And again, this is just a, a, potter, a, a pitcher on a potter's wheel. The work of the hands of the potter. And so he is making us into whatever is according to his will. Just like the Holy Spirit is praying for you to be made according to whatever the will of God is. Which is Christ's likeness. So when we look in the New Testament, we see the same language when he says in 1 Peter 5, verse 6 through 10, when he says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, he is saying, stop rebelling and start submitting to your forming up. Stop rebelling and let God form you. Humble yourselves. That means you've got to stop resisting and submit yourself so that you can be formed. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Casting your care upon Him because He cares for you. Now He's given you the antidote for your sufferings. And that is, you've got to take everything you're dealing with and put it in God's hands and accept His answer. Cast your cares upon Him because He cares for you. And He says, then comes the warning. Be sober and vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And so he's attacking you while you're down, while you're going through suffering. And all the Lord is doing is allowing that to show you what your weaknesses and your sins are. When this dross comes up, when he begins to attack you and try to impose things upon you in your area of weakness, then you'll be dealing with stuff, evil stuff. And then that's when you, when you bring it to the Lord to have it taken away. You own it, say, that's not what I want. And you, got, you tell him, tell the Lord you want to be His follower. You don't want the things that you're being tempted with. And so you have to learn to fight the devil. 
And he, te he tells us that too. That when, we say, when he says resist the devil and he'll flee, he's saying you've got to fight. Rebuke him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you've got to fight to break off an attack. That's what resisting is. So whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren um, that are in the world. Now we've got other places that resist the devil, but he's saying here, resist steadfast in the faith. He intends for you to fight to resist the devil with whatever he's coming against you with. But the, grace of, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after ye have suffered a while, now this is what he says he's going to do. He's using this suffering. After you've suffered a while, that this God of all grace will make you perfect, established, strengthened, and settled. So he's doing a work upon you. Now this word per perfect means spiritually mature. That's what it means. It don't mean sinless. We're never going to be sinless. And the process that he has begun with shaping us and forming us and taking away um, the, the sin and, and, and the powers of the flesh to live a crucified life, the things that He's doing with us is a process that is intended for your whole life. It's not going to be complete. The work on you will never be done. And so, this making you spiritually mature and establishing you and strengthening and settling you in this faith, say. So these passages show some sources of our afflictions. They also teach us to submit to His molding of ourselves into new creatures and not to spend our days rebelling and being angry that he allowed suffering, which usually comes through some, a door of someone's sin. In other words, it may not necessarily be your sin. Someone else that's this, this deep in pornography and got secret sins may molest your child. Because the more that they are given to these secret sins, the more power Satan has over them. And it can lead to possession. And they end up doing something that they normally wouldn't do, but it's because they, they, they opened this door and Satan has a legal right to go through it if you open that door. If you want to have secret sins and do evil in secret, well, that's going to give him power over you. And so it may not be your door. It may be someone else's door that you get hurt by. But Satan is playing in that too. But you can have your own doors by secret sins. And that, that's a place for Him to enter. It's a place for Him to work. And so these are, these are things that the Bible teaches us about, about Satan and his work and the afflictions that, that are caused and then what God will do to turn it to our good if we're not rebelling. Okay? Now, the first step is to show you your dross. So in... Whenever we're going through sufferings, then whatever is bad about us is going to come up. Whatever it is, it's going to be coming up in our minds. Whatever failures we have, they're going to manifest when we're kicked down, when we're hurting. Whatever failures we have. And so, Proverbs 25, 4, it says, Take the impurities out of silver, and a vessel is ready for the silversmith to mold. And so this is, this is just what he's teaching us about, about life. We have impurities. And we're ready to mold as soon as those impurities can be taken away. In Isaiah 1 verse 21 through 22, I guess we're looking a couple places here in Isaiah, but it says in 21, How has the faithful city become a harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. And so he, this is the way it is with churches sometimes too. And so something very faithful becomes something like a harlot to God. And it says, Thy silver has become dross, and thy wine is mixed with water. He said, Everything's diluted. Um, and um, the, it, the silver is just worthless. It's dross. And so he says, This is what he says in verse 25 I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away thy dross and take away thy tin. He said, I'm going to just. I'm going to turn my hand upon you and it's going to cause all this dross to come up and I'm going to take it away. He says, I, th this is the work after the fiery trial, see? I will restore thy judges at the first. He has a plan to restore. 
I will restore thy judges at the first, and thy counselors as at, at the beginning, and afterward thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment, or converts with righteousness. And the destruction of the transgression of the sinners shall be together. And they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. So you see what happens? First the fire is put to it. Okay? The dross comes up. Those that submit to His molding, they become these, these counselors that He's looking for. When He said He restored judges and counselors, then the city is safe again. But those that, that forsake the Lord during their time, that they're going through trials, blame God, get angry, go get drunk, do all the things He doesn't want you to do to deal with your issues. He says for them, the, the destruction of the transgressions and sinners, they're going to be together. We're going to, we're going to remove that from the city. So it'll be a righteous city. This is the way it works. It's your choice. The sufferings are going to happen. Crucifying the flesh, another reason for sufferings. So there is a plan to put you under renovation of the Spirit. We see in Romans 6, verse 3 through 6, as it talks about baptism, it's a perfect model for teaching us God's plan. He said, Know ye not, so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. He wants the old man to be put to death. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death. That like as Christ is raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. It's all about putting to death the old man and giving us a new life. And he says, For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we should be in the likeness of his resurrection. Again, that's bringing us to Christ's likeness. And he, he explains it in verse 6, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So the old man, the sinner, it's got to be crucified with him so that there's a change and they're not serving sin anymore. You want to know what that looks like? In Galatians 5, verse 24 and 25, it says, They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Some versions, modern versions translate that passions and desires. Affections and lusts is just fine though. That's got to be crucified. The spirit man needs to be ruling, not the fleshly man. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. That's what he says in 25. So there is a plan for the flesh to be crucified with Christ and for a new man to live. A, a, man, a man that's in the likeness of their creator. Conformity by the work of the spirit. Well, we, we see from the Old Testament there was a prophecy of us being given the Holy Spirit in the New Testament times. And in verse 25, he spoke of doing this in the future. He says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. He's talking about taking away our sin. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. And a new heart will I give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. So this is something that's not been done in the Old Testament. When prophets prophesied, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon them, and they would prophesy, and then they would leave. It wasn't like now where we're given the Holy Spirit, and He's a permanent resident. It's not like that. Even the kings were given a measure of the Spirit, but the Spirit would come upon them as well. Okay? And so... Um, he said, I will put a new spirit within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh. And so he's saying, I'll give you something I can work with and I'll put the spirit within you to do the work. And so this is what he says in 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Now I want you to see that the plan for the Holy Spirit, his job was to cause you to walk in God's ways when he put him within you. Well, some people are pretty stubborn about letting you, letting the Spirit do that. Cause you to walk in God's ways. They want to become a Christian, but they, they want Jesus to do all the dying. And so what happens is, you get introduced to suffering. Until some of that rebellion and stubborn resistance is broken down. And you're reaching for Jesus and conforming to His will for you. So that's the way that happens. So in Titus 3, we see it's fulfilled. 
In 3 through 6, as he talks to us about the Spirit here, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish and disobedient and deceived and serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy and hateful and hating one another. That's kind of what's what people do when they don't know Jesus. But if you think you can know Jesus and still do that, you're wrong. He says, so... But after the kindness, love of God, our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. So, yeah, we're not saved by works. It's by His mercy. But, He says, by the washing of regeneration. Now, that word means, means to be born again. And renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now, this word renewing means renovation. So, the Holy Spirit is on the inside renovating us, bringing us into conformity to God's will. And so he's doing exactly what Jesus said he would do in the Old Testament through the prophets. He's renovating us. The renovation of the Holy Ghost. So he's saying that he saved us. His mercy saved us. But he's saying his mercy is including both the regeneration and the renovation. So it's not like that's a separate deal. That's why we got these words by. See, by this and that. It's because... It's through His mercy He gave us a new birth and gave us the Holy Spirit. If you think that you're going to be okay with your salvation part while you resist in the renovation of the Holy Spirit, you're going to find out you're not okay. Okay? So, He says what He shed abundantly upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior. The Spirit affects change and prepares you for the life of Christ to be manifest in your body. Now, there's plenty of scriptures that talk about this sort of thing. The Spirit is doing a work to prepare for Christ to live out the Christian life in you. And so in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7 and 18, he talks about the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Okay, he says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But he's saying that liberty does not prevent the work of the Spirit being done. There is liberty, but there's not liberty to rebel against the work of the Spirit. And so he says, but we all with open face beholding in a glass. He's just talking about looking in a reflection. We're seeing the glory of the Lord and are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So he's saying the Spirit of the Lord is changing us to be more like Jesus. Sufferings are used to make us pliable, to make those changes more possible. Okay? So in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8 through 10, it says, We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. So he's talking about all the things they're going through. They got trouble. They got distress. They got despair. They got persecution. They're, they're being cast down. He says... But they're always bearing about the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus. So they're suffering through all these different kinds of trials. And this is why he says that they're doing it. Okay, This is all about this list of sufferings. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in your body. All he's saying is that Jesus wants to live out his life in your body. The Christian life. And you need to be in a place where He can do that. And sometimes people can, well, all the time, people can't get to that place where He can do that without the proper level of sufferings to break down the resistance and the rebellion. So He can do that. And so He wants to live out the life, the life of Jesus. The life also of Jesus might be made manifest, as just being made known in our body. So in Galatians 4, verse 19, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. That's Jesus Christ being formed in you, His character. Okay? That's, that's what He's... The, the travail is the suffering. Okay? Till Christ be formed in you. Colossians 1, 26-27, The mystery that has been hid from the, all ages... And from generations, but now is made manifest to the saints. So there's something being revealed here that's been hidden. To whom God would make known to the riches of His glory. This mystery among the Gentiles. So it's being revealed now. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus wants to live within you. That's the mystery. That's what's different in this covenant from the old covenant. 
to create a right relationship with com and, and companionships. You know, sometimes it's like David said, you know, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now we're okay. In your righteousness, you afflicted me. But now we're okay. We got a relationship again. Well, that's the way it is sometimes. Sometimes people start to get away from the Lord. And sufferings and trials will come into their life to bring them into a right relationship and have, the, and have Jesus for a companion. It's not just something you pick up on Sunday and put back down on the shelf when you're done. It's, it's a relationship. One that is like a life relationship. Every day we get up and we reach for Him. Every day we talk to Him about everything that's going on. Every day we, we talk to Him about the things we need help with. Every day we're telling Him, we will, I don't want to do this, but I will do this if you help me. That's the way we're talking to Him. Because we're different. We're not resisting. Abide in me and I in you. So the, the famous John 15, I'm telling you, something so valuable and so beautiful that is thrown away by all these people with these false doctrines who don't want to believe you to be in a relationship with Jesus to be saved. Which is just sad. So Jesus talked about the relationship using plant and, and, and vines. and he, uh, uh, Vine and branches, I mean. I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch that is in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. So this is, this is the unfruitful servant. They're taken away. They don't get a free ride. They, if they're in a relationship with Jesus, it's going to show up in their fruit. If they're not in a relationship with Jesus, that's going to show up too. And so he's talking to us to teach us this. And every branch that beareth fruit, he'll purge it. Now that's going to be troubles and sufferings. That it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me. This is your choice. Abide in Jesus and he'll abide in you. It's a mutual agreement. And if you, if you deny him, he's going to deny you just like we read a moment ago. You break off the relationship, he's going to break off the relationship. I'm sorry, but that's the way that it is. You don't get to just believe in Jesus once and then go do your own thing and expect that relationship is going to be good at Judgment Day. If you abide in him, he will abide in you. And as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. If you abide in Jesus, the fruit will be a natural product. You're not trying to work yourself to heaven. It's a natural product. The works will be there because you're in a relationship with Jesus. It'll be the fruit of that relationship. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Without me you can do nothing. And that's the way He wants us to live this life. Without Him, we can do nothing. That's the epicenter of this message to me. It's like, you can't do it without Jesus. You can't go to heaven without Jesus. You can't be righteous without Jesus. You can't bear fruit without Jesus. You can't go to heaven without Jesus. You have to be a branch on the vine. You have to be in a relationship with Him. And if a, vi if a branch is on a vine, it has got sap coming to it from that that vine and it is in a relationship with that vine and that vine is life giving to that branch and when that branch is broken off it will die and so will you if a man abide not in me he is cast forth as a branch and he is withered he's saying what happens to the branch if it chooses to leave the vine and this branch didn't go to heaven because it still believed Men gather these branches and cast them in the fire and they are burned. It's not going to go like these free grace theology preachers say. It's going to go like Jesus said. That's the way it's going to go. The Bible's always true. Men are not always true. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be given, done to you. He's talking about answering prayer because of the relationship we're in. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit and so shall ye be my disciples. So we are Jesus' disciples. Okay? Repentance and drawing near and humble submission is what God wants. So when we look at Psalm 73... It says, It is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord. 
that I may declare all thy works. So he has a testimony because he's in a relationship with the Lord. And he says it's good to draw near to God and put his trust in him. So when we look at James, the New Testament ideal, on the flip side of that, it says, Do you think this passage means nothing? That the spirit that lives in us wants, to, wants us to be his own? So the spirit we we're given, it's trying to bring us into this really great relationship with Jesus. To be his own. And he says, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. The proud is being resisted because they're resisting God. They want to do their own thing. They want to be their own God. Just like Satan told Adam and Eve in the garden. If you eat this, disobey God, you can be your own God. Well, they are, they are also wanting to be their own God and do their own thing. It's the same sin as from the beginning. So God resists the proud because they're resisting Him. But He says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. That means fight. And He will flee from you. you got to fight because He's going to come. He may depart from you from a season, but He's not omnipresent. He can't stay on you all the time. Okay? You can have a fallen one assigned to you. Paul did. When he said he had a messenger of Satan to, to buffet him, he's telling you what the deal was right there. It's, it's a, fall, a messenger is a fallen one. Same word for angel. You can look it up. He had a fallen angel assigned to him to torment him. And that's what was going on with him. Well, you can have one assigned to you too. But you can resist them and learn how to fight spiritual warfare. See? And the, the, those things are in the Bible. But you know what? It's not something preachers teach today. But there are things in the Bible, and, when, and a lot of times we learn it from angels. So when, when uh, the devil tried to steal the body of Moses, Michael said, The Lord Jesus Christ rebuke you. That was spiritual warfare. That's what that was. And so we can rebuke the, the devil in the name of, and even the name of Jesus sometimes was a weapon. And it seemed that there, had, there was different levels of power and authority in that world. Because there was one that they couldn't cast out in the name of Jesus. And so, sometimes fights are hard and bitter. That's all I'm saying there. Okay? Sometimes he said, Jesus said that you had to resort to fasting to, to do this. To deal with this one. Okay? So, he said, draw nigh to God and he would draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. And so, he's asking, hey... Submit to God, resist the devil, then draw near to him, draw nigh to him, draw nigh to him in a relationship. And he's saying, you've got to cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn. This is what he was talking about, repent. Be afflicted and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he'll lift you up. So it's repent and draw near to God, resist the devil, fight. These are the things he's telling us to do. Okay? Draw near. Trouble makes us de desperately need God. This is unfortunate truth, but when we're in trouble, that's where we go. If we love God, we, we chase after. So David said in 1 through 10, Isaiah, I mean Psalms 57, to the chief musician, I don't know all these people's names. Um, I wouldn't get them right anyway, except for maybe David. It says, when he, when he fled from Saul, this is he's saying, this is when he wrote the psalm, when he fled from Saul and was hiding in the cave. He said, Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. So he was really just, just calling out to God because he was in trouble. He says, I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. And so he had some trust that he would be helped. God shall send his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions. So he felt like, you know, the devil's called a roaring lion. You just, in a, in a lion's den, it's what it feels like. My soul is among lions and I live even among them that are set on fire. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue is a sharp sword. So it's not only the slanders, but it was the attacks and it was how oppressed he was feeling with Saul chasing him while he was hiding, hiding in this cave. 
But, thou, but be thou exalted, O God, and above the heavens, let thy glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps, my soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me, in the midst, in the midst there, into the midst whereof they are fallen themselves. So he saw that they would fall themselves into the pit they were digging for him. And it did happen, eventually. Just not that day. Saul fell, and so did his sons, and David was made king like he was promised. But at this time, he was writing these things. He was hiding in a cave. We're almost done, y'all. He goes on. Um, we got two slides, I think. Uh, trouble, re re trouble resulted in commitment and praise. So this is how he ended that same psalm. My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. So he, he, he was fixing his heart upon God, focused upon God in that relationship, and then singing praise to Him. Awake up, my glory, awake, posture and harp. I myself will wake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto the, among the nations. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds. So this is what he was doing. He was just praising God in his, in his circumstances. Then he had a history with God. So in, in whenever these things were over, in Psalm 63, verse 6 to 11, it says, When I remembered thee upon my bed, and meditate on thee in the night watches. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. Those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth, and they shall fall by the sword, and they shall be a, uh, shall be a portion for foxes. But the king, see he's king now, shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. And so we just see that after he had a history with God, this is the way that he spoke. That he hid in the shadow of his wings. He, he, he trusted and, 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 and cleaved to God, meditating upon him in the night watches. And so this relationship was really good here. See? Because he had a history with God. So in conclusion, you know, it's like what we said. The trials, the storms, the sufferings, they will either develop us or destroy us. It's your choice how you respond. There's a right way to respond in a wrong way. But that's all that I'm going to share with you. I'll turn it back over to the brother in charge.